شهاد اي ام دي every bit of development there. We think it's great news. But Windows 7 users will be best served through Mantle, um, unless they want to upgrade to, to Windows 10. Great plan for them, yeah? I've just played with Windows 10, I love it. That's one reason, an awful lot of people using Windows 7. The other one is that for AMD, Mantle is our innovation API. It's where we will solve future problems, whether that be in graphics or in compute. And by owning the API, we can do anything with it. We had problems with working with DX or with OpenGL because it requires a third party, Microsoft or Kronos, to make changes. If we're doing everything ourselves, then we're in control of our own destiny. And that doesn't intend to disparage Kronos or Microsoft. They're great partners. We love working with them. But sometimes you have to solve problems on your own. Okay, uh, my second question is, uh, do you think 4K gaming will grow in the future? I think 4K gaming will grow and ro grow really quickly. The, uh, the price on 4K monitors started off at about 1,000 euros or 1,500 euros. Actually, you could pay much more than that if you wanted to. These days, um, five or 600 euros will get you a 4K system, um, a 4K monitor at least. And I've just got one very recently. In the last couple of weeks, I've brought one up. Um, I have a, an AMD CPU, an AMD uh, 290X Crossfire system. It's really, really lovely to play. I put my boys, I have two sons, age 16 and 19, and they love the Rome games, the, the Total War games. They've been playing Rome 2 on it. And now they have an opportunity to play it on maximum settings on this, this big, I think it's a 32 inch display with 4K settings. The richness of detail is fantastic. When you can play a game absolutely set to the max, why would you not? Yeah, it's a lovely, lovely thing to do. So, yeah, the prices will continue to fall. People will love it. Okay, next question. Uh PC gaming versus console gaming. Like it's a competition between the two. Yeah. <laughs> so for, for me it's not. We have a console in the house. It happens that I have an Xbox 360 around. Um, and I may well, uh, I'm not, probably not supposed to say which console I'll buy first down the next <laughs> generation. Um, those are going to be fun places to, to play as well. But the truth is sometimes you want to play a console game. You know, you have a, a kind of perfection to the experience. You never have to install drivers. You never wonder what's going wrong with your yeah. PC. You never have to upgrade a graphics card. Everything just works. But sometimes you're willing to pay that price to have the ultimate experience. You know, I've just been through that experience with a PC. And it's a trade-off. You know, that, that PC takes me a while to put together. It takes a bit of configuring. Yeah. Sometimes I need to update drivers. But they're both beautiful experiences. Yeah. And I, I don't think that it's a choice between the two. Sometimes I want a social game where I'm playing in the living room and a console is a choice. Sometimes I'll go and, you know, I'll get my head down and focus entirely on the 4K screen in front of me, lose myself in that. And that's okay. Just like we see with PCs and tab uh, or tablets and phones and so on. Now, these haven't stopped PCs being successful. The PC gaming market, the console gaming market continue to grow. These consoles have sold, more, have sold more rapidly in this generation than ever before, and it's a testament to the quality of the experience. So I, I have no problem with them all coexisting together. And unfortunately, if you want to buy all of them, it's expensive, but at least you're buying AMD tech. And uh, usually we forget it, but uh, what about uh, mobile gaming? What about mobile gaming? Oh, I think there's a, a, a perfectly good place for that. Yep. Like I said, people buy all. I have, I have a tablet, I have a phone, I have a PC, I have a console, and I play those different setups in different situations. One thing I won't tolerate from a phone is a game that takes a minute to load, because usually I want to play for one or two or three yeah. minutes or something like that. And for that kind of situation, if I pick up a game which is simple and takes a handful of seconds to load, or you know, two or three, something like that, 
it's very variable and it's a great way to play short-term kind of game. If I want something with a lot of complexity, then I'm probably going to have to have a complicated controller as well, yeah. like maybe a keyboard or that kind of stuff. I'll put up with a minute or two of loading time because I plan to invest hours yes. of my evening. I think they, they have different parts in, in life. The, the surprise, I guess, to those of us who come from a PC heritage is just how attractive console uh, phone and tablet gaming is. Sometimes I turn on my, my phone on my tablet and think, I'll just play this for a minute or two. Yeah. And three hours later, that minute <laughs> is still going on, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's, let's talk about uh, the future of gaming. Uh, which technology will uh, be playing uh, an important role? Uh, for example, what do you think about the virtual uh, reality? Yeah, it's, it's the one I was going to pick, so you take me in the right direction with the question. <laughs> I think virtual reality is, um, is a fantastic opportunity for for everyone in the business to to reinvent gaming yeah. in another guise. It's a great way. One of the things that's maybe not obvious is that for a real VR system to work to a to an extraordinary quality where pretty much everything around you is potentially photo real rendered and you're totally in an environment. To do that we're going to have to deliver something times as much as much horsepower, a hundred times as much, sorry, horsepower in a single GPU. So AMD is a, is a graphics company, we love that kind of challenge. 100x, we can do that in something like 10 years, probably a little bit less. That's quite something. PC gaming, we can probably get to photorealism in about five years. Doing that in a um, in a VR environment, perfecting the quality of the rendering there. But the, the VR guys themselves have a way to go. They've probably got another year or two before they have a real quality product that works everywhere. Um, and then we have another handful of years in which we improve our graphics as well. So that in something like 10 years time, you'll be able to play that and you won't be able to tell the difference between the real world and strapping your helmet on. That's a nice ambitious place to yeah. aim for. Yeah, so you think that uh, virtual reality could be the future of gaming? I think it's it a really possible. big deal. It's a really big deal. There are some games that don't carry over, but most do. And there's going to be a whole raft of games, new games, which take advantage of that. The fact that you're really in there, yeah, I think it's a, it's a tremendous future. I think, for example, education. Mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got two sons, age 16 yeah. and 19. Take them back 10 years to when they were at school. They were learning about things like the ancient Egyptians and the ancient And they Greeks. can see it. No, they can see it, yeah. If they strap on this helmet, they can actually go into yeah. a world where they can see a pyramid as it was and they can explore it. They can see it. If you've ever seen the pyramids, they are incredible in size, just yeah. astonishing. I had the, the, the considerable pleasure of going Going to see the pyramids three years ago and it's mind-blowing how large they are a single photograph never shows you that get into a world where you have a, a simulation of the pyramids and it's all real and you can superimpose it on you know, the current rather ruined state of things really really informative so I think there's great use for education and, and yeah. more stuff okay last question uh, you have the scientist in uh, Max Payne uh, can you tell us something about uh, this experience? Uh... Of being a mad scientist? <laughs> yeah, I'm the mad scientist. The, uh, the main part of the experience that I remember having, having played the game a little and talked to people who play the games is dying. I've been shot more than most people have in this world. <clears throat> uh, but, but the privilege of being in a game like that, I love the guys at Remedy. They're such smart, capable people. The privilege of being in this industry, working with some of the smartest people in the world, absolutely love what Remedy did 10, 15 years ago. Terrific stuff. These days I'm completely addicted to what the guys at DICE do with Battlefield. Oh, Johan yeah. Anderson, I'm always mentioning his name. One of the smartest guys on the planet. Arguably the best programmer in the world. It's a real privilege to work with people like that. The joy of my job is working with people who are astonishingly smart and solve problem after problem that you think well, I'm not sure if these could be solved. You're very so, lucky. I'm, I'm very, very lucky indeed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you for this interview. Uh, per questa breve intervista è tutto, vi ringraziamo per aver guardato questo video e ci vediamo al prossimo video su Games Appelli Blog Day. Okay.